and welcome back to the SCI Virtual Event Cert Alignment with Cyber COI Challenges and Gaps. We're pleased to welcome in Dr. Jose Morales, who will give our next presentation, which is Enhancing Mobile Device Security. And Jose is a researcher for the Cert Division within the SCI, and he has conducted research in cybersecurity since 1998 with a current research focus on forensic, forensic analysis, behavior-based malware analysis and detection, suspension, s- suspicion assessment theory and implementation, mobile malware, and malware distribution networks. He graduated with a Ph.D. in computer science from Florida International University in 2008. And before coming to Carnegie Mellon, he was a postdoctoral research fellow in the Institute for Cybersecurity in the University of Texas at San Antonio. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Jose Morales. Jose, all yours. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about my topic of current research, enhancing mobile device security with defensive and offensive options. Uh, the things I'm going to talk about is how mobile devices, how are they currently being protected, and what is not being protected, which I'll tell you right now, is private information stored on the device. And we're going to look at an option to protect private information using fake information. We're going to talk about the prototype that we have, how we've constructed it, how it's been tested. And we're going to introduce some defensive and offensive options and how you can take fake information along with GPS location and leverage it. So first, the current state of the art. What do we currently have? in mobile devices. You can have mobile devices that are encrypted. That only allows, avoids physical access to the phone. You have anti-malware, which is mostly signature-based. You have static analysis tools. Those are only useful in the post-infection environment. You have dynamic analysis tools, which are basic heuristics, not very effective. You have passwords. Typical password on a phone, four characters. Privacy settings. This allows the user to, uh, to control how apps interact with the phone and what information apps will give to the phone and to the user. We also have, in an Android specifically, OS-level app isolation, which means each app runs its own process, memory, its own VM, and they all interact with each other. Overall, currently mobile devices are pretty well protected. But the truth is that malware only needs to get your permission to install on your phone. The current way in which apps are installed, they ask the user, grant these permissions and I'll install the app. Don't grant the permissions, you don't get the app. Well, the user wants the app, so he has to grant all of the permissions, even if those permissions seem a little dubious and over the top for what's for the purpose of the app. This allows malware to just come in in a legitimate way. So in the classic way of malware infections, they exploit vulnerabilities, they use social engineering. Here, none of that exists. The app just has to be chosen by the user because they like what it does, and they install it, and that's it. It's game over. What's at risk here is the private information stored on the device by the user. Since the user legitimately allows the app to install and grants all the permissions, it can freely access all of that information. That information currently is not protected by anything that I have listed on this slide. So what do you do? Well, a potential solution to protect private information is to use fake information provided by the phone to specific apps. And this can be done when the app is first installed. The user can choose to fake the information that the app requests from the device. Some of the benefits of doing this is the app cannot distinguish fake information from real information on the phone. You provide the same data structure with the same information, the app just requests the device ID, it gets a device ID. There's no way for it to tell this is not the device's actual ID. It's being given to the app by the operating system. So there's no distinguishing features. The app will function as expected. There are some approaches 
to avoiding apps abusing private information by uh, denying access to information or returning a value equivalent to a null, a void. But what that does is you don't know how the app is written. And you don't know if the app requests GPS locations and you say, I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to deny you access to the GPS. How does that affect the app's functionality? It could crash. It could stall. It could completely stop functioning in the expected manner, and that could further put the device at risk. Those are not good options. You want the app to function as expected. And by giving fake information, the app requests, gets what it wants, and it functions as normal. Uh, the users can be notified when fake information is accessed. You're purposely giving it fake information. Let the user know that that's happening. You'll see later, we have a flashlight example where it's reading stuff off the device that you wouldn't think it would need for the flashlight. And the benefit of fake information is the user can install any app they want with the peace of mind that their information is protected. If they're feeding fake information, their actual information is not being touched by this app to which they're having some uh, doubts about. Another aspect of fake data is we, you can keep track of how much fake information is being read. And the user at one point can decide, this app is reading too much fake information. I don't want it anymore. And it can uninstall. So you actually help guide an undecided user as to, should I keep this app? Should I not keep this app? By reporting how much fake information has been read. At the end of the day, by providing fake information, the real information, the private information, the actual, is being protected and the user can can go on using his device without any actual concerns. Okay, another polling question. This one from Jose would like to know, do you want to hear some more benefits of fake data? So we'll give you about 15 or 20 seconds to vote and Jose, we can move on until we get some results here. All right. So continuing on the line of um, fake information, we developed a prototype that creates fake profiles. What we did was we modified the Android operating system to create three to four fake profiles when the device is first activated. We provide an installation option called fake. When you install an app on Android, it usually says grant the permissions, yes or no. We have now yes, no, or fake. You choose fake, the fake option, as we call it, is turned on, and that app will be fed fake information. The type of information that we are providing fake data for are the details of the phone, like the IMEI, device ID, photos, contacts, outgoing SMS, and the uh, GPS, your, your longitude, latitude. That's what we have so far, but we found that we can fake a lot more information. We just felt that those were the most critical as far as privacy is concerned. By providing fake data the way we do, we do not deny an app access to information and we never give it a null return value. That's very important as we've discussed before because it, it this allows a scenario where the app could crash, the device could destabilize. Every time we built into the system settings a notifier, every time fake information is read, the app reports it, the user can look at it at any time. We're going to see some snapshots. The user can look at the report for any specific app. Not, not only will it tell you how many pieces of fake information it's read, how many times it's read, but it'll tell you exactly which fake information has been read how many times. From an analysis point of view, that's also very useful. That wasn't our primary focus of the work, but it's a secondary uh, benefit. And it serves to protect private data while the user evaluates the app. As we said, our prototype allows users to install desired apps 
with questionable permissions, and it gives them an evaluation period where they can try the app, play with the app, do whatever they want with the app, with the peace of mind that their private information is actually not being accessed by this app. It's almost like a protected trial period where I decide at the end, I don't want it, I'm going to uninstall it, and nothing specific to me or my phone has been put in uh, at risk. Jose, I'll jump in real quickly with those survey results. 72% would like you to work in some, some benefits of fake data. So I'll go back to that, uh, yeah. that slide there. The key thing to providing fake information is you don't want an app to unexpectedly crash on your device. And you want to be able to give users the ability to install any app they want from any source they want. We all know that there's Google Play and there's Amazon Marketplace, but there's also third-party markets. In the third-party markets, you get free versions of the apps you would typically pay for. But those free versions are actually repacked legitimate versions with malware in it. When a user decides to uh, install an app from any of these third-party markets, even from Google and Amazon, which research has shown uh, does not block all malicious apps from being uh, available for download, they either have to say yes or no. So if they grant all of those permissions, you're going to have access to all your information in a legitimate, authorized fashion. But if the user is a little concerned, the fake information will provide them the, the, the cover to not access their real information. It provides the app the information it requests, and it doesn't put the device at risk. Also, on top of that, as we'll see later, in the defensive and offensive options, you have fake information that the way we have it is automatically populated on the device when first activated. But you could also modify that information to show what you want. And there's benefits there. So I hope that... Uh, I hope that addresses yeah. there. Excellent, thank you. They're looking for. So we'll continue here with the prototype. So the testing of our prototype, we took the Android OS source code and we modified it to, to implement fake profiles. We downloaded several apps from Google Play, Amazon, and third-party markets. We wanted to make sure that these apps would run as expected, would not crash, would not cause unhandled errors and the device would function as expected and the user experience was not ruined while at the same time assuring that when an app uh, um, requested a piece of information that was being faked, that fake information would be given to it without, uh, without delay and without any, any OS layer errors. So the reason why we implemented it in the OS is because it's very difficult to subvert. If we had done fake profiles as an app, it could have been subverted by other apps. An app could figure out a way to work directly with the OS and ignore the app. But by building in the security of fake profiles directly into the operating system, you're being proactive. And by being in the OS, it's very difficult for any app to, to, to subvert especially when the way in which the private information is requested by an app is standard API calls to Android OS. Uh, during our testing, we didn't have any messages from apps suggesting that they suspected that fake information was being fed to them. Therefore, there was no distinguishing features. The app could not tell that we gave them a fake email and not the actual email on the phone that we gave them a fake photo or, or we, we sent out a fake outgoing SMS as opposed to the actual one that they wanted to go out. The apps worked as expected. There were no crashes. There were no slowdowns. There were no halts. This is very important. The app functioned as expected. The user and the OS and the app were unaware that there was fake information in the background being fed to it. Other apps on the device that are not being fed fake information also worked as expected. So when you have fake profiles, you have two separate data structures, one with the fake information, one with the real. 
what we found was the apps that were being fed the actual information off the phone worked as expected in spite of having another set of information over here identical to it, which was faked. Both the faked information and the real information was fed to their relevant apps with no problems. One uh, interesting observation, I don't think there's a surprise to anyone, it's the vast majority of the apps that we tested over request permissions and exfiltrated a lot of the faked information. Uh, it, things that the app should not be accessing, it did access, has fake information, and it would exfiltrate it out. We never followed exactly where it was sent to. We just know that it was sent out of the device, typically via uh, TCP over Wi-Fi. Some of the main things that we noticed that were constantly read was the device ID, the owner email, and the GPS coordinates. And uh, we reasoned that this had to do with um, ads for free, free apps. The ads are relevant to your regional area, give you a more regionally located uh, advertisement. The hopes to click, make a few pennies. The prototypes showed that fake information did what we expected it to do. It empowered the user to install any app they desire from any location they want. Even if it has questionable permissions, they can install it, run it, and their private information is protected. And the prototype showed that that can be implemented, used, and actually carried out in a practical manner with no concerns, slowdowns, crashes, or anything else being negatively affected on the device. So now we look at snapshots. I love snapshots. So first, we chose this, um, this app here called Superbright LED Flashlight. We chose this on purpose. It's a very basic app. You should only access the light bulb on the back of the device to actually function as a flashlight. We got it from a third party uh, website called APK for fun. This is its download page. So you visit this page from your device. You click on the link, then the download process starts. At this point, it will initiate the device's Android OS's native installation, which provides our extra option for fake information. So here we have the details of it. You hit the download button. Now here, we see that at the top, LED flashlight download complete. This shows that it finished. Now we're going to get the question. It shows information about the flashlight. Here is the, the typical installation screen. It shows you all of the uh, permissions that are being requested by the app. On a standard Android OS, on this screen, at the bottom, you would only have two options, cancel and install. But we added the third option called fake. You choose that option, the app will be installed as expected. It's not modified in any way, but on the OS side, we make a little modification to say this app will be fed fake information and not real. So on this next slide, we have here the, uh, the system settings for Android. And if you look, one, two, three, the fourth option in the system settings is called fake option. So we put this new settings uh, menu here. If you click on it, it will show you reports and preferences. The preferences, as we see here, are all the apps currently installed on your device. The ones with the check marks are the ones that are being faked. In other words, these are the ones that are receiving fake information. Now, I presented a few slides ago how to uh, activate the fake option at the moment of installation. But if you're not able to, or you decide not to put on the fake option when you first install it, you could always come to this screen later on and just click and put a check mark next to any that are not checked 
And by putting that check mark, you will activate fake uh, fake profiles on that app. And we see here at the uh, second from the bottom is lead flashlight with the the check mark on. So now this is the report side of the system settings. I'll go back one. This is the preferences. This is the report side. What you see here are a list of the apps that have read fake information since the time they were activated to read fake information. For example, we have here Seafront Kite Poet 158. That means it, it has read a piece of fake information 158 times. Second one, we have uh, Talking talking Ginger Free. That's read 17 times fake information. And the last one is our LED flashlight app. That's read fake information 51 times. Now, it's important to notice that from the time we took this screenshot, from the time we installed the app, to the time we took this screenshot, there was about 35 seconds had gone by, maybe no more than 50 seconds had gone by uh, with us going between the screens. In that time period, this app had already read fake information 51 times. So it's important to notice from an analysis standpoint, a high volume of reading in a short period of time should make you a little suspicious about the app, especially if it's a flashlight. Shouldn't read anything. So now, if you click on any one of these uh, app names in the report, you'll get details about it. Here is a screenshot of what happens when you click on the LED flashlight panel. It shows you the specific pieces of fake information that have been read. And these slides have a prototype where the, the names were the actual names that Android OS uses. It's not very user-friendly, but since then we've modified them so it's a, it's a, the value has a name that's more understandable by anybody. We can see here for each value you have next to it the number of times that it's been read and the last time in which it was read. So for example, second one down, device ID has been read 11 times and the last time it was read was 18 seconds ago. Uh, we have here, uh, the last one is the country of the device. That's been read nine times, and the last time it was read was 18 seconds. So we want to provide not just the number of times each piece of information has been read, but we felt that showing the timestamp of when it was read last was important to give the user the, the idea if it's being active or not. If it just reads it once and that's it, or if it continuously reads. The last thing you want to notice on this screenshot is at the bottom you have the uninstall button. That's also something that's not available. We put that in there. The reason why that uninstall button is there is when the user comes here and sees that their app is reading too much fake information, they've decided they don't want it anymore we give them the option to uninstall it right away as opposed to having to go and follow some other process that Android provides. It's easier and it's direct and lets them get rid of the app right on the spot. So here, this is what you get when you click on the uninstall button. You, uh, you get the standard Android OS uninstall process, OK or cancel. You choose OK, it will be removed. All right. Now we're going to talk about some defensive options. We chose to take fake information, and we chose to take the device's GPS location. These are two very powerful uh, data points on the device. What we did was, based on where the device is currently located, we can enforce fake information profile policies. We can specify fake information as input to potentially all apps. What this means is we create a security policy that checks where the device's current location is. 
based on that location, we can say, I want fake information given to all the apps, not just the ones that are currently made to follow fake information, to be fed fake information for everything. And the scenario that we had in mind was the app, uh, the device is in a location way out of its usual, what we call the comfort zone in another part of the country, in another country, across the world, and there's security concerns. This device is normally not in this part of the world, so it's fake everything, because we don't know exactly where it is. There might be some questions about who or what is being done to it. We can provide crafted fake information. If the device falls in a GPS coordinate that's outside of our comfort zone or of what we decide to be a safe or a green zone, we can purposely not just provide fake information, but specific fake information for specific reasons, such as to give the illusion that the device is not where it actually is. Let's assume your device is on the opposite side of the planet of where you currently are. You can create a profile that says, if it requests the GPS coordinates and we're on the other side of what we consider to be a green zone, don't give it the current information. Don't give it fake information. Give it these specific coordinates. And those specific coordinates may actually be of back home or anything else you want. Something that will not entice or call the attention of the people reading or requesting that information. What you want to do is you want to provide crafted information that's boring and unusable. Boring and unusable is whoever's collecting it will say, this is not for us. The hope is that they'll just let it go and they'll forget about that device, not touch it again. If it requests information about the Android OS or the device itself, you give it fake information about that too. What we did was we give it information that gives it an older version of Android, a different device model, a different device type, anything that makes the device look like something that's old and probably not attractive to the people collecting the information. The point of all that is to have people stay away from the device so you can defend the information. Hopefully the result of this is people become disinterested. They become disinterested with the app, the device, and the data on it. And it's not targeted any further. That's important. This type of approach is very useful when a device is out of home base, which we call the green zone. You can be in another state, another region, another country. An example is a civilian workforce abroad. When they take their private phones, they're doing contracts in other parts of the world. Okay, we're going to launch another polling question just to help us drive the flow a little bit of the presentation. And again, Jose would like to know, would you like an example of out of home base? And while you're voting on that, just a quick reminder to everybody uh, to visit the files tab that's found in your console and you can walk away with a PDF copy of all the presentation slides today as long with uh, certain SEI work in uh, the cybersecurity space. And let's see what our results here, Jose. 71% yes. So can we get another example in? Sure. So currently, U.S. military has uh, bases and embassies. The government has embassies. Military has bases all over the world. Part of the for workforce in those bases are civilian contractors. Now, civilian contractors travel to a country to work on their contract on a military base. They have their work phones, their work devices, and they have their personal devices. Personal devices are used on personal time. So now you take a civilian contract employee working in a foreign country where we have an embassy or a military presence. The country supports our presence there, but they don't necessarily agree with us or are in, uh, don't necessarily like us to be there. They just support the fact that we're there. So this civilian contractor on his personal time goes to a cafe. Every cafe in most other countries have free Wi-Fi. Gets on the Wi-Fi and uses it for Skype or FaceTime or WhatsApp or anything else to talk with family, to talk with friends 
while he's on that Wi-Fi in that cafe in a country that doesn't necessarily agree with our presence there, that Wi-Fi signal can be maliciously read and recording everything coming out of the phone. In those scenarios, if there's no fake information on there, the apps to which the user, that civilian employee is running, can be sending out private information into the hands of people he doesn't recognize. And we don't know what the result of that information could be. Intelligence, coordinates, anything. It could, let, it could give away to people that we are, are not in favor of where we are, our locations, by just knowing that one civilian employee contracted by a specific company, his device or her device is a specific part of the world is a very valuable gem of information. In those scenarios, providing fake information, purposely telling anyone when you're on a Wi-Fi in an unrecognized region that you're not really there, that you're somewhere else, along with fake information about you and your device, if that Wi-Fi is being maliciously monitored, they will be disinterested and possibly walk away. The key thing to remember is the people who are looking at that Wi-Fi signal may not physically be there. You don't know where they are. All they see is traffic on a Wi-Fi. You provide crafted fake information, they could become disinterested, and that person is safer, along with the rest of the civilian workforce and our interest in that region of the world. So I'll continue now. Excellent. Thank you. So now let's look at some offensive options. The key thing with fake information is you can purposely mislead the enemy with specific fake information. This is very important. Faking information can misinform the enemy to think what we want them to think. And that's key. You can use this as a tactical device in any sort of operation with a pre-installed app. The scenario is this, you have a device, you put an app on the device designed by us that transmits specific fake information depending on where the device is located. You take that device, you issue it out into the field in any capacity you see possible. It could go out in any type of operation, any part of the world. Depending on where the device lands, the app that we've designed start to purposely send out crafted information that we pre-designated and pre-installed on the device. You can abandon the device, or it could be uh, um, uh, placed in a, in a, in a tactical uh, scenario. When this happens, if the Wi-Fi or the signal that app is using to send out the fake information is being read by others, you're going to be feeding them Fake intelligence is what it is. You can give things like fake GPS locations to make the enemy think that we're somewhere where we're not. This can mis mislead the enemy and give us an advantage to better prepare for any type of operation. You can have the enemy focus on a theater that's not real or a bogus theater. If you're in point A, and the app is saying you're in point B, and they pick that up, they're going to focus on B, but you're really in A, is where you are. The other thing we can do is we can fake contact information that we control. This is more of an intelligence aspect. By giving fake contact information, if they start to exploit the contact information that they've gathered from the device, you can pick up things like the IPs that they're working from. You can have cyber offensive capabilities Let's say you give them a fake email address or a fake website or a fake phone number and they reach out to it. We can record where it came from and now we can explore that number and gather our own intelligence from it. If it's an IP address, we can hack back onto it to try to see what we can do there. At the same time, they think they're getting real information, but they're not. They're getting what we want to give them. That's the key. And you can further compromise their systems. The next thing you can do is you can provide fake photos and outgoing SMS messages. This can mislead intelligence, which creates opportunities for us. If we tell them, if 
Bar app tells him the device belongs to a specific person of a specific role, and the apps relate to that person's role, they're going to think they're getting their hands on intelligence of pictures and messages relative to our operation in that region. By us purposely faking that, we can make them think differently, and that gives us the strategic advantage. As far as other offensive options are concerned, there's limitless ideas as to how you can leverage the type of fake information you want to uh, uh, you want to send out from the device, depending on where you are in the world. It's limitless to your imagination. Now, when you think about this, what we put together was by modifying devices in this way, providing these apps that purposely send out crafted fake information that we pre-designate and put out in the field, what you end up with is a ghost device. You can make a whole army of ghost devices where each device is controlled by us, set up by us, sent out, deployed by us for the purpose of misleading our enemies to our advantage. And this reminded me of uh, the ghost squads of World War I and World War II, where they would make fake tanks. As we see here, we have a, a picture of an inflatable Sherman tank being used in World War II for Operation Fortitude. What did that tank do in that operation? We landed at Normandy in France. Those tanks were set up at a different location to make the Nazis think we were somewhere else and gave us the advantage to better plan and face less of a defense when we came in. Uh, with that, I'm going to give finally the current status of what we're doing. This is my uh, last slide. The fake profiles, uh, the, fake, the prototype is up and running. It hasn't been publicly released yet. We're seeking partners, evaluators, stakeholders. Uh, our future work, the fake profiles that we have, we want to create patches. We've only tested this a little bit. We want to create patches. You can apply fake profiles to any commercial phone running Android OS, and we want to make those available to um, partners that we work with. Ghost devices have been designed but not implemented. We're looking for stakeholders who are interested in further uh, pursuing that. And we want to take our work from Android OS and apply it to iOS, which the operating systems at a high level are different, but they both sit on the Linux kernel. They both can be used in exactly the same way that I've provided here. They both have the same model of grant all permissions, install, grant no permissions, don't install. And we're seeking stakeholders. So if you're interested in any of this, reach out. My email will be on the next slide. Okay, before we start our Q&A with Jose, I just want to remind everybody or anyone that's just joined us for the morning to make sure you fill out that survey upon exiting as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. And we'll get into the questions for Jose. Some which you just answered, Jose, but we might have to repeat some. But uh, from Brent asking, if possible, could you please differ, differ, differentiate between fake and camouflage? Fake and camouflage. Well, I've never, I've never heard the term camouflage. Uh, just, just thinking about it a little bit, I think they're probably both. Camouflage might be real information that's uh, encrypted and ciphered, sort of uh, made to look to hide the information. But fake information is an actual different value completely separate from its real counterpart. So let's say you have the device ID. You have the device's actual ID, then we provide a fake ID, two separate pieces of data that represent the same thing. Uh, I'm not sure, I apologize, I don't know exactly what camouflage is, but it seems to me a camouflage would be the real device ID sort of hidden or modified slightly to look a little different. And, and if it's like that, we have two separate values. Camouflage might just be one value. And part B may help here too. It says, historically, it has been possible to identify some categories of fake identifiers in um, 01. How does one ensure fake identifiers are not immediately obvious? Well, what you want to do is, and the GPS location is one good example of this. You don't want to have 
information that's way too far off from where you really are. So if you have someone on the ground who knows that a physical device is in a certain place and they pick up a Wi-Fi signal, let's just say California, for example. If you're in California, the people know it's somewhere in California, but your device is sending back that you're in Florida, that's an obvious flag. What you want to do is you want to have things that are relatively in the same region, but not specifically in the same region. So if you're in Los Angeles, California, you can send out things that say that you're in San Diego or San Francisco or even Portland, Oregon or Seattle, something relevant within the region. And for every other piece of information, things like device ID, email, or email, you want to have a fake email address, but that is active and usable. You want to have something that doesn't exist and bounces back. For other information, photos, contacts, you can make relative, uh, relevant uh, phone numbers and emails that are active and can be reached out to as opposed to things that, if they're used, are blatantly not valid. That's what you want to avoid. Okay, we've got two questions about asking about iOS, when it will be available, but one, one differentiator is, uh, will, will Apple Lock make this not possible to do on iOS? So all the other types of uh, security that have been put out on these devices is to, is to uh, avoid access to the device, avoid access to the information. But we built fake profiles under the assumption that the app, the, the device is being used legitimately and someone downloads an app that has been uh, granted all of its permissions and therefore is authorized to get all the information. So anything you put in the way of accessing information, the user using this app with these questionable permissions will give access to it because they chose to install the app as opposed to malware in the past that sort of hides in the background and exploits things to get access in a stealthy, hidden manner. This, all, this is wide open. So there's no blockades between the app and the information. Therefore, anything like Apple Lock, as long as the user allows that app to access the information, it will get it. Okay. Can we put up Jose's uh, email address again when we get a chance as well? We have a request for that. Uh, next question from Frank asking, how can we obtain the Android OS that permits fake identification? Uh, just reach out to me to my email address and we'll talk offline. Okay, the next we got, uh, just another question about, an, is there an estimated time frame for the fake application to be ready for iOS or non-Android phone? iOS development hasn't started yet. Um, the reason is, We've been focusing on the Android version. Uh, if you are interested in the iOS version, which is what we want to pursue, we're seeking stakeholders for that work. They reach out to us, express your interest to us, and then we can uh, put a plan together to implement it. The approach is, abstractly, the approach is the same. The implementation is just slightly different. Okay, question from Don asking, is there, are there any legal ramifications of using this fake data that you've come across or any issues there you're aware of? We haven't considered legal aspects of this, but if I have my email address and then I, pr I create a second email address for spam, and when I log on and join mailing lists and websites I don't use very often, I put the spam email address because I know I'm going to get inundated is there a legality issue there? I don't think so. It's the same thing on the device. I have my legit email address. Then I have another email address. That's a legit address, but it's fake. It's not mine. The fact that it's uh, uh, fake means it's not my email address, but it's still a valid email address you can use. I just, it's not my private one. I don't think there's a legal issue in that scenario. Okay, question from Raj asking, will this work on any version of Android OS? Uh, one of the things that we, we want to do is uh, create patches for any Android OS version. When you use the Android SDK, you can build it for specific devices, specific OS versions. If you want us to test it on yours, reach out to me, and we can, we'll can we make a patch, we'll provide it, to, uh, and we'll test it before handing it out to you. Okay, folks, that's all the time we have for this presentation. Jose, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Great presentation. Uh, folks, we're going to take a break here from 1135 to 1210, so we uh, 
catch a lunch break for here for the East Coast. Uh, we'll be, be back promptly at 12.10 for SEICOO Robert Bela, Beeler giving a presentation um, that you don't want to miss. So uh, we'll hope you join us back at that time.